Friends, it's a great delight to be here. There's a handout that includes uh, the main uh, quotations that I'm using in this talk. Some of them haven't been published, so uh, it will be useful for you to have that open in front of you. Well, it's a great honour to have been invited today to give this lecture for the Jonathan Edwards Centre here at Trinity, and I extend my gratitude to Professor Sweeney, not just for his invitation today, but for his long-range uh, support for me and my ministry in Australia. I'm the only guy in Australia who researches Jonathan Edwards, uh, so it's a pretty lonely career. Coming to the States from time to time, either at Yale or here, is a wonderful fillet for my soul. My former principal, Graeme Cole, is now your dean. I served as his senior student while he was principal of Ridley, and with several other Australians here as students or faculty, I've been very welcomed. Thank you. And no, no less, this topic is close to my heart. So I look forward to your responses this afternoon, either formally or informally, to the presentation. The importance of mentoring is mainly assumed, but rarely expounded. However, examples abound of its contemporary importance. Now, the story is told of the IFES movement in Peru during the 1980s, which was a particularly difficult time for the nation of Peru, for a guerrilla movement known as the Shining Path afflicted the country. So on campuses, large public meetings of Christians were banned, and it was very difficult for Christians to book small rooms for small group Bible studies. All they could do, that is the IFES movement in Peru, was to build their student ministry around one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and it boomed. Now, we do the opposite in the West. Uh, for the sake of efficiencies, we, we schedule large public meetings and possibly a small group program, and then on campuses, if time and availability uh, is there, we have mentoring ministries that we uh, encourage as well. But the Peruvian movement shows that you can build a whole student ministry around mentoring successfully. Another example of contemporary mentoring uh, achievements, you might have heard of the show The Biggest Loser. Australia has its own version, Australia's Biggest Loser, a weight loss show. And the woman who hosts it, who's one of the personal trainers, her name is Michelle Bridges. Uh, she obviously has now a wide uh, public presence because of this show. But recently she was interviewed on a, on a chat show. And she said, yeah, buy my DVDs, buy my books, uh, do what you need. But she said the most important thing, if you want to develop healthy living, eating well and exercising well, is to get yourself uh, a mentor, a personal trainer. More important than buying her product, she said, was having a relationship of accountability because electronic resources only get us so far. It's true, isn't it? We can rely too heavily on purchased resources for our lifestyle goals, but actually a friend might do as much or more in helping us live uh, a flourishing life. And as I travel in the US, I hear friends speak about the pressure they face in their university context or their college context to provide mentoring. A friend of mine is the head of department of philosophy at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, and he uh, gets great pressure from the dean to provide that kind of level of student support, but he has no time or resources to do it. I spoke recently with a lecturer at Gordon College in Boston, whose dean was also pressuring them to provide mentoring, though no training to go along with the pressure. And I met also in Massachusetts recently a US Air Force chaplain who's being asked to do the same thing without any support or training in the topic. Mentoring's become a buzzword, but perhaps more importantly than a buzzword, uh, it's been recognised that this is a neglected way of training and development. But why the uptake? Well, it could be that globalisation has a distinct downside. Uh, our world is more connected than ever before, 
I don't have to persuade you of that through social media or through the movement of global capital. But it's also more fragmented than ever before because we try and live our lives simultaneously in different places. Uh, our emotions are geographically spread, or at least our emotional connections are. But even when we do, uh, through online media, present ourselves, we often choose to present ourselves in particularly flattering ways. Where we live, our sporting and schooling commitments, our home and church life are often in different neighbourhoods. And since the 1970s, family breakdown has led to a renewed quest for a deep sense of attachment. We're experiencing the results of having raised a fatherless generation, uh, where families without structure or authority or accountability fail to promote emotional stability. Of course, we don't look to political leaders as models. Their embarrassments on both sides of the house or both sides of the aisle and churches having lost their confidence in their place in countries like Australia or in the United States are undergoing radical rethinking about what's our missional purpose, which is not a bad thing in itself. It just means that training leaders for a church that we're not yet sure what it should be is a double whammy. We don't know how to think about leadership succession adequately in the church. The postmodern turn in philosophy has encouraged us to see the local as more authentic than the universal. But establishing who we are without any external point of reference or the belief that there's even a self to create can be dizzying and destabilizing. Our lives are segmented or fragmented and we need help to make the parts fit together. For these social and emotional and spiritual reasons, I think mentoring increasingly meets a profound need. I have students knocking on my door, not quite daily, but almost, asking if I might meet with them. But I want to appeal to you to exercise a ministry of mentoring in your church or in your environment here at seminary for theological reasons, not merely for social or emotional ones. And if we're talking about theological reasons for mentoring, then we couldn't do better than look at Jonathan Edwards as a provider of timely assistance. Now, it's commonly assumed that Edwards was a bad pastor. After all, he got sacked from his church after 23 years of ministry. But let's not rush in. I do agree that he didn't suffer fools gladly and he had very high, perhaps overly high, expectations of himself and others. His conflict resolution skills may have needed some honing and his responsibilities outside of Northampton took him away from his parishioners. But even with these disclaimers, I want to suggest that Edward's understanding of the human soul, his commitment to preaching to a ministry of the word that's applied, and as well his one-on-one -on -one ministry of encouragement and training, make his pastoral labours worthy of study and emulation. In mentoring, he was eminently successful. So we do ourselves a disservice if we fail to acknowledge his example. Now I take it that mentoring is an intentional ministry between two individuals that results in spiritual empowerment and personal integration. An intentional ministry between two individuals that results in spiritual empowerment and personal integration. So in this lecture and in the book I'm writing, I investigate Edward's mentoring ministry under the headings of his authority and the agency of those being trained. Indeed, the exchange between his authority and their agency. I want to understand how Edward's experience and passions and gifts are applied to the needs of those whom he's developing and, and encouraging. Uh, I take it that individual agency is well summarised as, I quote, participating actively in shaping the worldly means to be employed for realising divine and collective purposes. 
And that agency stands in relationship to a channel of authority understood as a supervening source of legitimation, creating reputable credibility. Now, in the book, those categories will be explained further than today. But they're useful categories nonetheless as theological entry points to examine Edward's mentoring ministry and indeed to learn from it for the possibilities of mentoring under modern conditions. We deal with the same questions about authority and agency that Edwards himself uh, confronted. So I present this lecture in three parts. Uh, Taste the Lord, the effective turn in Edwards' context. Uh, Fear the Lord, the pursuit of wisdom or the prudential key in Edwards' mentoring. Uh, the the next category on page three there, see the Lord, the beatific vision and the task of imitation. Uh, I'll make some final words about Edward's legacy, though this lecture won't concentrate on it. If you don't remember anything else from this lecture, please may these three words resonate loudly in your minds, singly, particularly, closely. For these three words, together, singly, particularly, closely, uh, words Edwards used to describe the kind of educational experience Indian children in the Stockbridge School should expect from their teachers. And I think they aptly describe his approach to the mentoring experience in education as well, singly, particularly closely. So taste the Lord, the effective turn in Edwards' context. It will come as no great surprise to you that Edwards did not invent mentoring. It's enjoyed an exalted place throughout history and in the church, taking various shapes in various social contexts. It can be traced back to educational models in ancient Greece, to scriptural themes of intentional teaching and learning in the book of Proverbs, for example, or the model instruction of Jesus and Paul in the New Testament. Perhaps all of them uh, derive from the universal pattern of parenting in which a mother or father pa patiently passes on to an individual child knowledge and skills to lead uh, uh, a healthy, flourishing life. From the third century, and particularly in the medieval world, monastic communities promoted this kind of posture of one-on-one -on -one faith transmission in the context of friendship and carried, importantly for our purposes and Edwards, this theme of one-on-one -on -one ministry forward, describing it as well. Pope Gregory, uh, Pope Gregory the Great, in his pastoral rule, tries to help his clergy appropriate some of the practices from the monasteries, particularly the practice of intentionally and deliberately pastoring members of the congregation. He's bringing monastic assumptions and helping his secular clergy act in ways more like a mentor. However, the Protestant tradition from the 16th century forward effectively eliminated monastic life as a context for leadership development. That's particularly the case in the English-speaking world. Now, to some degree in the Reformation, uh, the idea of uh, mentoring was taken up by the secular clergy or regular parish ministers who developed ministers fraternal in which they could cultivate deeper friendship and accountability. And some academics in colleges, particularly Oxford and Cambridge, saw their role as fellows in those colleges as a kind of mentoring experience, certainly one in which they cultivated the importance of friendship, remembering too that Oxford and Cambridge colleges were chiefly monastic foundations in the first place. But by the 18th century, by the century under review today, the need for more thinking about uh, the development of leadership for a moral citizenry emerged within political questions concerning the cultivation of republican ideals, and not just 
in America at the time, but in France as well. Uh, Fenelon, uh, for example, wrote his fabled work Telemachus, the son of Ulysses, to critique the rule of King Louis XIV of France and to provide an alternative way of understanding political virtue or virtue cultivated amongst uh, the citizenry. Now, the leading character in this morality tale is named Mentor, who was an incarnation of the goddess Minerva. And Mentor's role was to prepare the mentee, Telemachus, for his future role as king of Ithaca. Now, significantly, Edwards had read this book, and indeed, it was widely circulating in uh, colonial New England. And he gave this book to the guys he was mentoring to read, presumably to discuss. Not only that, but in uh, 1758, Samuel Hopkins, one of the famed mentees of Edwards, wrote to Joseph Bellamy, another Edwards mentee, and in that letter described Edwards as mentor with a capital M. So it's not just that the idea is circulating vaguely in New England, it's that these two young men, by 1758 perhaps not so young, uh, were describing Edwards deliberately in the terms of being a mentor. Uh, Bellamy and Hopkins were mentees in an 18th century drama to cultivate virtue for ecclesiastical and civil leadership. Now, I'm assuming that the practice of mentoring was an accepted mode of ministry in the 17th and 18th centuries, but descriptions are hard to find and explanations even more so. Now, I assume that Puritans would have adopted this kind of practice for uh, we, we read in Rick Kennedy's recent book on Cotton Mather, conversation as a means of attaining mutual unity and spiritual betterment was part of Puritan practice. So conversation, at least, is at the heart of what they think they're doing in providing a leadership development. But you can have conversation and that not necessarily be a mentoring relationship. It doesn't go all the way in describing, for example, what Cotton Mather did. Although he does write this, Cotton Mather, in his Manaduxio, his introduction to pastoral ministry. He writes, find some very wise and some very good person whom you may choose to make what we call a bosom friend. Be very careful of your choice for a faithful friend who can find. And when you have such a one, ask his advice in all matters of importance. So there seems to be in Mather's instructions to ministry aspirants the a value attached to finding a bosom friend and plying them with your questions. It's almost mentoring, though I'd like to know a little bit more about Mather's practice. He did want those conversations between the mentee and the mentor to be conducted generously and Socratically, backwards and forwards, with modesty. And he uses the phrase, they should be conducted handsomely. I don't know what it actually means to have a handsome conversation, distinct from the hand handsome conversation partners. That's what he wants of us anyway. He elevates the value of personal matters of influence uh, and learning in his ministry, and he sets himself up to be emulated. Indeed, students after graduation from Harvard would come back to visit him and consult with him for training and encouragement. The practice of mentoring existed, though it might be hard to put our fingers on exactly uh, how it was encouraged or described. Edwards himself had been a recipient of a mentoring relationship. His uncle, Colonel John Stoddard, had been a very significant influence and mentor in his life. Stoddard was an eminent lay Christian, had various responsibilities in Massachusetts, uh, and had provided some measure of support for Edwards, both when he got the job in Northampton, when he got the job in Stockbridge later, and in other crises of his ministry. 
But most significantly, when uh, his uncle John died, uh, John Edwards preached the sermon. And in that eulogy, describes uh, John started as a strong rod and a casuist who gave timely and wise advice, and I quote, in cases of conscience wherein I have consulted him. A casuist, that is someone who's practiced in case studies of pastoral wisdom. So Edwards has received this kind of ministry from his uncle, and it's been very important in his own personal development. However, despite mentoring being practiced through the ages, I think Edward's mentoring may well have been distinctive in as far as he appropriated and adapted uh, conditions of the day as the 18th century took, as Yaroslav Pelikan describes it, an affective turn. The affective turn in theology, as theology is recast in an affective key, where emotion, where personal relationships and commitment play a more significant role. I think mentoring in Edward's day was being renewed under modern conditions uh, with new approaches to authority and agency. For example, Harvard and Yale were no longer seen as nurseries of piety for young men wanting to become ministers. They were reneging, it appears, on their spiritual responsibilities. So young men awakened to the spirit, a sought out alternative uh, oversight, sought out alternative methods of formation. And the social mobility of the day meant that people wanting to find a mentor, someone who would cultivate their own and ministry skills and gifts, uh, they would turn to that person, travel and stay with them. This was now formation built on elective affinity, choosing the person who your heart warms to, rather than institutional fiat. These young men were naturally drawn to pastors whose hearts had been warmed and in whom they witnessed vital piety. The Pursuit of experimental religion or the power of godliness as the foundation of Christian life and service. More and more required teachers who themselves had this foundation and demonstrated the power of godliness in their own lives. And students would go out of their way to find those kind of mentors or teachers, the kind of person that their college education wasn't provided, providing. Uh, Intensity of experience in conversion suggested the need for intensity of relationships in training. As many uh, writers on the history of pastoral care have said, in a time of rapid social change, one-on-one -on -one ministries of various kinds have become increasingly important because in times of rapid social change, the institutional church seems less to, seems less to have less to commend it. It seems to be outdated, creaking, croaking. And so the one-on-one -on -one experience is attractive when the church is less and less so. And this is the way Samuel Hopkins describes Edward's ministry. In times of the outpouring of God's spirit and the revival of religion amongst his people, Edward's study was thronged with persons to lay open their spiritual concerns to him and seek his advice and discretion, whom he received and conversed with with great freedom and pleasure and had the best opportunity to deal in the most particular manner with each one. He was a skillful guide to souls under spiritual difficulties. People routinely say Edwards was in his study 13 hours a day or whatever it might have been. He was a bookish kind of guy. Yes, he might have been in his study 13 hours a day, but look what was happening in his study. He wasn't merely writing sermons. He was thronged by young men and women wanting to receive from him spiritual advice because their souls were distressed. He was a skillful guide to souls 
under spiritual difficulties, Hopkins writes. Edwards, though chiefly positioned as a moderate in the course of the revivals, still prized holy affections as the surest sign of regenerate life. Now, while John Locke would despise enthusiasm in religion, fearing it would have an adverse impact on educational outcomes, uh, it wasn't the case that for the revivalists they despised education. It's just that they changed education's pedagogy. As Lawrence Kremen writes in the book American Education, it was less that the revivalists downgraded religious education than they changed its pedagogy. They weren't anti-learning or education. They were developing new ways of forming and shaping the leaders of the church. Mentoring, I'm arguing, was newly valued. The effective turn in the 18th century witnessed the cultivation of new approaches to maleness as well, which would implicitly, perhaps not deliberately, shape Edwards' mentoring. For in the 18th century, when it comes to thinking about manhood or maleness, a new almost euphoric, I quote, almost euphoric optimism about friendship, sociability and human interaction came to pervade urban culture in New England. There's a new assumption about friendship in this uh, new birthed world. Peer relationships between young men once frowned upon as socially destabilizing, became an opportunity for sanctification. The goal of parenting in traditional Puritan New England was that your son should never have contact with peers. You provided your, your son contact with older men, uncles or his father, and that was the chief way that you helped that young boy or young man grow into manhood. What does Edwards do? He develops small groups for the youth of his church, for example. Peer relationships weren't now seen by Edwards as something destabilizing, they were possibly sanctifying, which in itself is not only a strategy for church structural change, but implies a very different approach to what it means to grow up as a man. Uh, Refuting Enlightenment preaching on rationalist religion, men like Edwards or Whitfield reaffirmed the central importance of affective response in appropriating salvation. We know that that was part of what was considered so suspect from many more traditional Christian leaders. As well, for Edwards, women became role models for men we note Edwards' depiction of Sarah Edwards or Phoebe Bartlett in the faithful narrative. And these women were presented, a girl in Phoebe's case, as a revived believer worthy of emulation. This was a very unusual thing to do in his world. Now, of course, the affective side of relationships existed before the 18th century not least amongst uh, men and boys who spent much time together in the warmer months farming, in the winter months in the home. And ministers were often described as nursing fathers, picking up the language of Paul from 1 Thessalonians. But still, even if there were a commitment to effective relationships before the 18th century, new philosophical streams emerging from Scotland in the 18th century, a fashioned affection into a new key, and sentiment took on new moral value. Perhaps even the assumptions of Baconian science may have fostered an approach to the science of the soul, which empowered mentoring as well. In these and in many other ways, we can see how Edward's historical moment reinforced the reasonableness of the mentoring project. And though this uh, provides context for Edwards' ministry, we now need to investigate some concrete practices to show how 
this context shaped ministry on the ground. But first, a question, and I'll end each section with a question. How effectively rich is your experience of mentoring? What do, to what degree does emotional intelligence play itself out in your being mentored or in your providing mentoring to others? To what degree do we see mentoring as passing on knowledge? Should we perhaps see mentoring as cultivating uh, the affective life as well? Well, fear the Lord, the next heading, the prudential key to Edward's mentoring ministry. We've suggested that uh, developments in Edward's world supported commitment to the task of mentoring. What we have to do now is look at some of the practices on the ground. It might be hard, we'd think, to find concrete examples, but Samuel Hopkins' diary and Bellamy's notebooks are some of the most fruitful for understanding how the mentoring relationship between them and Edwards played out. Whether climbing Mount Tom near Northampton, conversing with a mentee along the way, or meeting with a small number of mentees to discuss a theological ministry topic, Edwards pursued this form of faith transmission and leadership succession with relish. His method, put boldly, was to deal with people as individuals and like a midwife to draw out the very particular needs and aptitudes of those individuals being mentored. Singly, particularly closely, I want to argue was his approach to a mentoring ministry. He wanted not just to instruct universally or anonymously, but he wanted to apply timely wisdom to individuals as well, seeing all of their life in the light of God's providential rule. One of the most outstanding strategies was homestays, young men coming to live in the Edwards manse. Two in particular, there might have been up to 10 or 12 who came to live in his home, but Bellamy's and, so and Hopkins' uh, stays are of particular note. Bellamy resided in the Edwards home uh, 30, 1736 to 1738, so probably just over a year, and his notebook kept during this period lists excerpts from reading which ranged over any number of different theological topics, uh, catechetical, catechetical questions, and dealt with philosophical arguments for the reasonableness of Christian faith as well. We see in those excerpts the kinds of reading, the kinds of topics that Edwards and Bellamy were sharing. We see how the thought life of the mentee was being cultivated. The books that he quotes are largely available from Edwards' own personal library. So you can imagine that they've once finished a chapter and handed the book back to the other for comment or for further reading or transcription. And many of those books quoted in the, uh, in the notebooks of, of Bellamy can be linked to the miscellanies that Edwards was writing in the similar period. Edwards is not just accidentally training future ministers, but intentionally so. Uh, he doesn't want Bellamy to parrot him, but to become an independent thinker. And Bellamy himself doesn't want his reading to be an end in itself. He writes, importantly, in that uh, notebook, uh, describing questions to be asked of catechists, this I hope they will own. He's not wanting just to teach theology, he's wanting the alignment of life with teaching in those whom Bellamy himself chooses to mentor. Now, immediately after Job Strong had moved out of the Edwards home due to problems with a blocked chimney flue, obviously he was coughing, the smoke filled his bedroom, uh, 
uh, Samuel Hopkins moved in uh, on December 19, 1741. So in, in the heat of the revivals, age 20. So he's in a unique position to observe and to participate in the great awakening from within Edward's home. It was a safe and nurturing environment for him. He arrived with concerns about assurance, uh, was very confused about the state of his soul. He writes not long after he moved in, I plainly saw that if I was left to myself, I should depart from seeking God and desire none of his ways. These quotes, which now appear on your handout, come from the Hopkins Journal, which has not yet been published or transcribed. So I give a number of them in full because these uh, are not otherwise available. I transcribed the document a couple of years ago in Philadelphia and they give an extraordinarily rich presentation of what it was like to live in Edward's home that year. He found in the manse parental-like care he writes, I hope I never shall forget the kindness I've received from Mr. Edwards and Madam, and I could not have expected more from my own father or mother. That's extraordinary. It's a kind of transgressive relationship. Edwards and his wife, Sarah, are doing what parents should have done. Edwards gives him encouragement to undertake new pastoral responsibilities, and I quote, This day I have concluded to go to Suffield next Sabbath, being persuaded to it by Mr. Edwards and others, supposing that they will otherwise have no preacher. So he's unsure of his capacity to preach and Edwards is giving him the opportunity and the encouragement to go. We learn of feedback given as a consequence of preaching. I quote, I then conversed with Mr. Edwards and gave him a particular account of my sermon and present exercises and of the hope I now entertained and soon, by his advice, began to preach. He perhaps still wasn't certain in his own mind that his soul was in a place to preach, but did nonetheless. He sees a model in Edwards. He heard Mr. Edwards preach last Sabbath. He studied three sermons last week. So they're talking about sermons together. This was for a place for Hopkins which seems most like home to me of any upon the earth. It's an exalted description of his experience in the Edwards home. Now, while not all those whom Edwards mentored lived in his home, this was nonetheless a powerfully effective strategy for leadership development. In fact, I, I discovered even just last week that John Locke had encouraged new approaches to the cultivation of virtue based on living in households together. It's a very modern, if we might say, experience of leadership development. But I have a question for you. It might not be that we can have many young men, young women, young families in our home, but we can still ask the question, how available are we to those whom we mentor? How much access to our soul do they have? Do they see the way I struggle with my finances or my anger or my marriage or my singleness? We might not have people in our home, but we can still ask the question, how available are we nonetheless? Well, another strategy for Edwards was friendship with conversation. Sharing uh, the house offered opportunities uh, to cultivate the two constituent parts of mentoring, that is friendship and conversation. Though Edwards is often reputed to be studious and detached, hold this intention with Hopkins' description, his conversation with his friends was always savoury and profitable. In this he was remarkable and almost singular. Or going on, his tongue was as the pen of a ready writer while he conversed about important heavenly divine things which his heart was so full of in such a natural and free manner as to be most entertaining and instructive so that none of his friends could enjoy his company without instruction and profit unless it was by their own fault, of course. He can offer friendship. That doesn't necessarily mean that 
it's received. He was a man who had a reputation for being friendly and a good conversationalist, at least amongst those who were prepared to learn from him, to engage with him on the level in which he wanted to teach. And indeed, it's his philosophical reflection on friendship and conversation which is so significant. It's perhaps not surprising that he was a friend. How he describes friendship theologically is very significant for our purposes. So Miss Selene 5.10 or 6.3.9 both contain very important uh, descriptions. If traditional relationships in agrarian societies were fixed and defined, in this era, new understandings of friendship developed, uh, partly as a response of human mobility and personal agency. Friendship was the buzzword of the 18th century, and Lombard writes. Parisian salons or London club, clubs or coffee houses exemplified new opportunities for leisure and conversation as a pastime. Conversation was not just merely a way of exchanging views, but in Edward's world had the important function of demonstrating that a man was capable of regulating his social self-presentation. That's a mouthful. Uh, you demonstrated that you were a man by running a, a family or a farm. But if in a world where it's unlikely that you're going to receive property from your family, or in a world where perhaps people through movement, through personal uh, mobility were marrying later, then how did you present yourself as a mature man? Perhaps conversation and the way you presented in those ways was a way of that kind of uh, self-validation. Edwards also situates conversation and friendship within broader ecclesiological and eschatological contexts. Uh, he writes, for example, hence it follows that the special affections that the saints have in this world to other saints that are friends will in some respects remain in another world. Death don't put an end to such friendship, nor can it put an end to such friends' enjoyment of each other. Remarkably, Christians, Protestant Christians since the Reformation hadn't spoken about the continuity of friendship between this world and the next. And here Edwards is talking in a kind of more sentimental way about how our friendships now will get better and better and enjoyed to a new degree in heaven. And indeed the church and society will benefit from friendship for, he writes elsewhere, all moral agents are conversable agents as joined in society and having union and communion with one another. Particular moral agents so united need conversation. Conversation is a way of making society work and making the church work for that matter as well. Friendship, he writes, above all other things that belong to society, requires conversation. It is what friendship most naturally and directly desires. Friendship and conversation become an anti-enthusiastic strategy, creating some kind of social stability, some context for the uh, passions to work themselves out in a confined or constrained way. Edwards is described by Hopkins again as greatly helpful by his direction and assistance against the two opposite extremes, both in conversation, preaching and writing. This group of mentees together created a circle of friends who in a sense become the renewal movement of the church within a church, a small body of piety who through friendship can spill over and affect the larger group, much like the German pietists had thought small groups of friends should be. Mentoring has these deeper eschatological or ecclesiological dimensions. So a question for us, how can we foster a culture of honesty in which friendship and conversation thrive and can be applied in mentoring. It's very hard just to say, oh, we're going to create a mentoring culture, but we can create a culture of honesty and accountability in which mentoring can take deep root.
letter writing. Uh, Edward's correspondence embodies some of these conversational and fraternal qualities. Uh, in fact, letters are one of the best ways we have to understand uh, Edward's modulations in pastoral address. He adopted not the traditional formal letter, but he wrote familiar letters. And we these days don't know that there's a difference between kinds of letters. But in his world, there were different kinds of correspondence. And the informal letter was designed to foster emotional intimacy rather than business efficiency or aristocratic formality. And so evangelicals became really well practiced at writing these informal or familiar letters. They grew, uh, they grew in authority and importance because many of the earliest novels were novels built around letters between two individuals. And in those novels, personal address uh, was being practiced in a new way. In fact, one of, the, one of those epistolary novels, Pamela, written by Samuel Richardson, uh, was given to Samuel Hopkins to read twice. And it's an interesting choice because it has a very morally confronting storyline and the heart of it is a rape scene. These familiar letters that Edwards chose to write as part of the, the cultural air that they breathed, uh, was met, were, were designed to interact with the minutiae of everyday life. And in one letter, for example, that Edwards writes to Bellamy, 1741, the range of topics that is addressed is remarkable. So there's some description of a recent awakening in New Hampshire. There's an apology for not being able to attend a meeting uh, at Guildford. There's the Organisation for Exchange of Books. There's attached a copy of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he concludes the letter, I am, dear sir, your affectionate and unworthy brother and fellow labourer, Jonathan Edwards. In another letter to Bellamy, he takes up the theme of the sheep, which appears in about seven letters, I think, from Edwards to Bellamy. And he describes the, the purchase of sheep, the shearing of sheep, the family's requirements of wool for the remainder of the winter. And then all of a sudden, mid-letter, he changes the topic to start speaking of post-Reformation dogmatics, the writings of Maastricht and Turretin, uh, then describes the uh, transatlantic concert of prayer, and then he says, Bellamy, you should come and visit me in February, for we have many affairs to confer upon. This is also a sign of the informal or the familiar letter, jarring changes of topic, which was meant to signal closeness, uh, intimacy, spontaneity, and candor. And Edwards, if you read his letters, writes uh, to many of these mentees in this particular familiar style. So I have a question for us. How effective are we in writing or communicating to those around us uh, in ways that are personally appropriate and that actually take time to construct? We're all time poor, but to love people by communicating well ought to take us uh, a good amount of time. Edward's relational dynamics also a transgressive. He approaches relationships in a way that might not have been so expected in his world. He's prepared to work against the norms of the created order, intrude upon relationships of creation, for example, between uh, a parent and a child. And he's prepared to do this because he thinks the minister is like the father of a family. Uh, sorry, uh, I'll quote here. Uh, he, Christ, as it were, brings those souls as an infinitely present, precious treasure and commits them to ministers to take care of. As a prince commits his treasure, his jewels and most precious things into the hands of one of the dignified servants of his household, or as the father of a family, when he goes on a journey into a far country, leaves his family to the care of a steward. Edwards is saying a minister is allowed to get inside a family's dynamics and function like a steward as if the father were away. 
He's giving himself or other clergy uh, quite a transgressive role in developing new kinds of relationships. I'll leave out the quotation uh, that he writes to Deborah Hathaway, but similarly, this is also an unusual kind of advice that he gives to her, uh, who was without a minister in her church, and he's functioning in that role by distance. This idea of Azat's parenting, uh, taking up responsibilities that perhaps others would normally have had, was quite common amongst those who were in the revived movement. The shepherd's tent in New London, Connecticut, or Timothy Dwight's role at Yale College were all seen in terms of in locus uh, parentis, functioning in a way that perhaps normally you'd have expected parents uh, to take up. There are many such uh, innovative approaches to relationships which Edwards adopts, not least for mentoring purposes. But I have a question for us. Have we lost confidence to serve counterculturally as physicians of the soul? Have we been so taken by the nuclear family, we forget that a nuclear family is not the last word in how we raise up form leaders for the church? We need to think ourselves about developing mentoring relationships, even if it does work against the grain of many of our church or family assumptions. So I've, I've taken up the question of uh, tasting the Lord, the effective turn, and uh, the wisdom that we should approach mentoring with in relationship by relationship, fearing the Lord. And this final theological point, I want to address us under the question of seeing the Lord or Edward's theological justification of mentoring via the beatific vision. Not only does Edwards do mentoring, he describes theologically how we should understand it. And it's only when deliberations reach this kind of depth that we can hope to find transferable principles. Just because Edwards did it doesn't mean we have to. But if Edwards gives us theological reasons for doing it, we have less convenience to avoid the topic. For Edwards, like the medieval scholastics before him, the sense of sight, the value of the visual, was an important part of life as a Christian. Uh, Edwards makes clear that the Christian life is caught as well as taught. We learn how to live as Christians not just from instruction, but from example as well. He believes that seeing how other people live should be a strategy for adopting certain practices ourselves. Now, you'd know as well as me that he, Edwards uses the metaphor of light frequently in his writings, and he describes the new sense in religious affections not as an extra sense, but as a heightening of capacity in all the other five senses. And indeed, our sense of sight is chief amongst them. Importantly, when Edwards is addressing his church uh, in the preface to the life of Brainerd, he says, there are two ways of representing and recommending true religion and virtue to the world, which God has made use of. One's by doctrine and precept, the other by instance and example. Both are abundantly used in the scriptures. And indeed, appealing to the example of the Apostle Paul, he writes, and it's there on your page, the apostle was a man of like passions with us. He had naturally the same heart, the same corruptions, but under the same circumstances, the same guilt, the same condemnation. There is this circumstance that attends the apostle's example to encourage us to endeavour to imitate him, which did not attend the example of Christ. We need human beings to imitate because they're weak like us. This is probably one main reason why not only the example of Christ, but also those of mere men are set before us in the scriptures. Further, there's deep logic in Edward's approach. For if every human being bears the image of God, we each of us have a deep connection with every other human being. Mentoring reflects that deep unity that comes through us all bearing the image of God. The concept of image comes out of visual epistemology. 
Edwards assumes that we're all part of the same life of God, either the world generally or Christians in a particular way. We are being conformed to Christ by degrees and part of the way we are conformed to Christ is when we allow examples to be placed before us to encourage us in that sanctified conformity. It's a gradualist approach to change, certainly, but nonetheless, the example of other Christians can put before us a transcendent ideal that we ought to also emulate. It's not just uh, Christ or examples from the scriptures that we can emulate, but in the quote I've given you there, we, we see that Edwards is wanting us to try and be like Christians who are already in heaven. We should follow Christ in the path that he's gone. The way that he travelled in was the right way to heaven. We should take up our cross and follow him. He's saying, of course, of course, the Christian life is cruciform. It's shaped by the death and resurrection of Christ. But uh, he goes on to say, we must be travelling towards heaven in a way of imitation of those that are in heaven, in imitation of the saints or angels therein, in their holy employments, in their way of spending their time, in loving, adoring, serving and praising God and the Lamb. We need to think beyond the example of Christ and already anticipate heaven by imitating those that are already there. But further, by spending time with Christ, we let his life infuse our own. He writes there, the glory of Christ is such that it's of a transforming nature, it's of a powerful nature, it changes all that behold it into the same image, it reaches the bottom of the heart, the most inner soul, it's a sight that purifies and beautifies. He that has seen Christ, he will, he must be like him. Christ is so glorious and his glory is of such virtue that everyone becomes glorious that is with him. We naturally fall into an imitation of them that we are conversing with and much admire. But conversing with Christ has such an efficacy that it changes the very nature. It's, it's like being with Christ irradiates us. His glorified life as we dwell on his uh, reign presently with the Father infuses us. It permeates to the depths of our soul. And in Edward still lived in a world in which the external could be understood to shape the plasticity of our internal life via impression. Though after him in the romantic world, it was not so much impression as expression that was seen to be the centre of human uh, mimetic experience. These are reminders that in Edwards, the visual can be sanctifying. The strategy might need some further explanation. But this at least reminds us in a highly visual world that we also ought not to despise the power of the visual, even if visions can sometimes remain ambiguous or incohate if not interpreted. But the vision of a heavenly reality, the beatific vision, has the advantage of becoming a fixed point of reference and makes good much deficit in postmodern spirituality by offering something eschatologically unifying and ultimately satisfying. Edwards has grafted his model of mentoring into an understanding of the first things, our image bearing, the near things, the value of the visual, and the last things, the beatific vision and in so doing gives us deep theological reasons for mentoring that rarely appear in modern mentoring manuals that are produced by our Christian presses. But we need to beware because those uh, efficiencies, the idol we have of pragmatism and not thinking theologically, can misshape what we expect mentoring to be. And we need to ask ourselves how well do we think theologically about mentoring in order that we don't short serve our practice. And so finally, 
Edwards wants us to be imitators of him as he is of the Lord. And we ought to think carefully about his successes and what we can learn from him. His own legacy was channeled through the labours of mentees like Bellamy and Hopkins, but many others besides. They continued some practices that they'd learned from Edwards, though there were some new theological developments, some new theological practices which Edwards may have been less satisfied with. But they certainly invited many people into their homes, provided lists of theological questions and reading, and provided ongoing individualised care. Uh, a great example of the legacy of Edwards comes when he was uh, contemplating taking up the position at Princeton. One extraordinary moment, he decides that he's not going to make the decision himself, but he's going to call together a small group of guys he's mentored and ask them to make the decision for him. That's an extraordinarily ambitious and brave approach to entrusting his mentees with his own ministry future. He's prepared to submit to them those whom he's trained, encouraged or empowered as a sign of his respect. It's of course true that we come to Edwards via his texts and his teachings and they've shaped uh, the history of evangelicalism and reformed theology of course, but we ought to not uh, leave without acknowledging that in his own lifetime most of the documents we now have were not publicly available or were only consulted selectively. It was his friends, his ministry colleagues, his mentees who in the first instance faithfully carried forward his influence through their own teaching, mentoring and writing. The first channel of influence from Edwards was personal and dynamic, not textual and fixed. Bellamy was a mentee before he was responsible for Edward's literary remains. We might read Edward's books, but we need to remember that uh, Edward's was a pastor before he was a publisher and a mentor first and a disembodied voice only much later. On a higher plane, it's the structures and life of the church which is the primary context for understanding Edward's legacy. For him, the church is a dynamic place of encounter with God through sermon, sacrament, song and supplication, where God's promises are heard, God's presence is enjoyed and God's purposes are promoted. So it's my contention in this lecture and beyond in the book I'm writing that just as Edwards modified traditional Protestant ecclesiology by nesting revivalist assumptions within traditional church structures, so in Edward's practice of mentoring, he takes traditional strategies for faith transmission and allows 18th century concerns about human agency and institutional authority to find new expression. If the church is a tree, contextually shaped yet theologically rooted, the same can be said for his mentoring. It's contextually shaped yet theologically rooted. Mentoring, I want to argue, is both rooted and responsive, enabling alignment of theological truth with the individual, the timely and the personal, with hopes that that investment will cultivate growth of the church for the future. Ultimately, it's Edward's ecclesiology which gives theological shape to his practice of mentoring. And as seminary or divinity school alumni, faculty or students, we need to ask ourselves the question if it's the needs of the church which are shaping our training or whether an enlightenment model of education is trumping the pressing value of investing personally in people who become the church's leaders. Edward's legacy is clear but ours is not yet established. Thank you so much.